Hi there, welcome to Board Gems. This is my regular video series in which I cover older board game gems. And I've gotten a lot of questions. I've tried to break up all the questions into topics, to group them by topics. And this, the final episode for a while, is a topic about this channel. So about board gems, about the YouTube, or about my process, I guess we'll find out what the questions are. I know you started board gems during the pandemic. Do you think you would have started the channel if the pandemic hadn't happened? Why? Honestly, I don't know. Very possibly not. I had been talking about it for at least a year or two, maybe longer. You can ask my friends. They, they would know. And it was something I talked about. It's like, oh, I really, you know, I want to do this because I, I found that I was really turned off by a lot of the new games. And some of my friends are enjoying the new games, and I'm joining them for games, and they want to play these games, and then I'm not really into it, right? And I thought, oh, you know, I, I should be doing this. But, you know, it's so easy to come up with excuses, right? And I have my share of excuses, right? We own two restaurants, can tend to keep uh, fairly busy. And if I'm doing the videos, the YouTube channel, that's time that I could be spent doing something more productive, maybe helping the business, right? Um, so it's very possible that I would have kept making excuses forever and never getting around to it. There would always be a better time later to start. And that's the interesting thing about the pandemic for me is that it removed all excuses. We had to close our restaurants. I was completely idle. If I don't start now, I have no more excuses, right? I might as well stop talking about it. So I'm like, okay, finally, finally do it. And again, I want to say, and I've said it before, but it bears repeating, Thank you to all the people who have given positive feedback. I know this YouTube channel is not going to be as popular as a lot of other ones due to its nature, due to the topics I cover, and also due to me. I thought I would try it for a year, see how it went, and you know what? After a year, I'd probably, you know, probably hard, hardly anybody would notice these videos, and then I can just consider that kind of just a fun thing to try, and then just move on after a year, right? And I've gotten so much positive feedback. I feel like I can't stop now. I have to keep going. <laughs> so, but so thank you for the positive feedback is what I'm trying to say. Now, you said your son composed the music. Is he studying music? And how did that come about? He doesn't study music. That's just a hobby for him. So the music that you hear during the how to play part is basically just an experiment that my son did. My son enjoys making beats, basically. Um, he he has a kind of a professional setup. I mean, semi-professional. I mean, he uses software, FL Studio, uh, Fruity Loops, to make beats. And, you know, he's gotten, uh, you know, plugins and stuff to, to really improve on, on it. And he's just learning, learning, and learning. And this music that I used for a long time in the how to play part was one of his early beats. He played for me, you know, a half dozen to a dozen just things he tried. And I'm like, oh, I like that one. Can you, you know, expand on it, right? Because you want something that loops, but you want it to kind of change a little bit, you know, over time before it loops back on itself. And that's what he came up with. And actually recently uh, he came up with a, a new one that uh, he, again, he played for me a couple and I liked that one and we decided to basically because he's learned more stuff about the process um, we decided to try new music and new how to play music uh, which we introduced in show manager and no feedback on the YouTube channel yet but on the board game geek blog I have gotten some feedback like yeah we, we like the old one <laughs> but yeah it's interesting you know when I was his age I was spending a lot of time playing Nintendo and Sega, right? <laughs> I didn't really have any creative hobbies that I can think of looking back. It's really cool that he has this creative hobby and it's not something that we, you know, like, because when I was a kid, my parents made me learn how to play the piano. But it wasn't because I had any interest in it. 
it was probably so they could show off show me off to their neighbors or or other family right but i hated it and i had to do it for so many years so i decided with my son that i was not going to push anything on him right and that's something he had interest in himself i'm just really happy that he has a creative pastime right I, i'm really proud of him and it makes me feel bad <laughs> because when i was his age i wasn't like that he's a better person than i am so look out future people 20 30 years from now he's gonna be like me but like a better me and i'm okay with that do you have any go-to youtube channels that you reference to learn new games no I actually do not like watching YouTube videos about board games. <laughs> and does that make me a hypocrite because I make videos about board games? I might be in the minority here. At least it, my observation is I'm in the minority. But I find that I have a hard time learning a game as it's being taught to me, like by a person. Like we sit down at a table and teach me a game and we play, right? Most people love that. I don't want to read a rule book, right? I just want somebody to tell me how to play. I see that all the time, like at the restaurant and I teach games at the restaurant. So I know how that is, but I am the exact opposite. Give me a rule book and I'm good, right? And even if it's a complicated game, maybe especially if it's a complicated game, I'm reading the rule book and okay, I maybe I didn't quite understand that part. I can go back and cross-reference like, okay, yeah, I think I, I've internalized it now, right? But I don't enjoy learning, especially a complex game in person. And invariably, I miss a lot of stuff. Maybe, maybe I have a bit of an attention problem, like I can't stay focused on the rules explanation the whole time. I really don't know, but that's why, for example, I really don't enjoy the convention scene. And we have some conventions in Vancouver, and I don't enjoy them. I go, but it's more for like, you know, seeing people I haven't seen in a long time and chatting with them. And if I want to play games at the convention, I'm happy to play older games, games that I already know. But, you know, everybody at the conventions, right, they want to try the new games, right? Maybe the convention has a library. And they've stocked it full of new games. Everybody has a chance to try them, borrow them out of the library to play them. And everybody, everybody's learning new games. And that is the perfect place for me not to learn games. Like that, that's the, the, the perfect storm, right? I'm, I'm in a convention, it's kind of noisy, right? Maybe nobody knows how to play and the person who's teaching it is their first time too and they're trying to read the rules and right? And probably will make a mistake. And if we don't make a mistake, I probably miss like a million things. For me, for whatever reason, I have a really hard time learning the game being taught to me. So I don't consult any YouTube channels on how to learn games. I mean, I feel bad that I, I can't really recommend many YouTube channels because I don't really use YouTube for board games. What have I done? I've watched a couple of Game Night episodes. Uh, for a couple of games I was curious about. I know I watched episodes on The Game and also uh, Lighthouse Run, which is a game I was curious about. And But otherwise, no, I, I don't watch those. I've watched or tried to watch one video of uh, Rado Runs Through. It's interesting, he's very energetic. Um, so all the power to him, but it's it's just not my style. And I've never watched like a how, how what's it called? Watch It Played? Never watched, never watched Watch It Played. So I guess the question is, watch it played? And my answer is no. <laughs> I won't watch it played, thank you very much. What's your setup for recording your videos? Is it just man and camera? Do you have any cool toys? Is your edit suit, is your edit setup you sitting with a laptop on the sofa? And a similar question, can you speak a bit about the whole video creation process? I guess I could take a photo of this setup here. So let me just do this here. Try not to pay too much attention to the games in the background. I, I tend to get lots of games and they go through my hands. Those ones are all games that will almost certainly go into the restaurant as opposed to like for myself. Uh, I don't record in front of those. So it's just like, that's a, a storage for the restaurant basically. So in terms of cool toys, I have 
a mic, a Blue Yeti mic that's pretty cool, and I got some lights um, to try to improve on this horrible visage that you look at when you watch my videos. At least, at least I can improve the lighting. I can't improve the face, but I can improve the lighting. Um, the camera is just an iPad, uh, which, you know, I, I guess that would be my next thing probably is that like, I would get like a nice camera, but, you know, there's also really nice cameras on things like iPhones. So I'm like, oh, when I update my phone, maybe I'll get like a more expensive phone, a fancier phone with a better camera, and I just use that. And, <laughs> and I haven't yet, so I'm just using this iPad. I hope it's okay. Really, the first thing that's done uh, as part of the process is is recording the how to play part. And the nice thing about doing that is it kind of sometimes solidifies some of my thoughts about the game, right? Once I actually start recording and I'm there teaching a game, um, I don't know why. It doesn't make a lot of sense, but it does help me, at least in my mind, kind of, yeah, just, just kind of have some of those ideas kind of coalesce into actual formable thoughts. <laughs> Before I record the why it's a gem part, I put together a, a bullet list on a Google Doc. And just, just all the thoughts I want to go over, all the things that I want to mention. Mostly they're just reminders. I, I'm not reading it in front of the camera, right? I just have it on like, like just off camera. So like taped onto these boxes that I have the camera set up on. And I don't read them. They're just there as a reminder if I kind of lose my train of thought, which is actually fairly common. So I'm like, oh, what was I talking about again? Then I can scan the list, go, oh yeah, yeah, right. So yeah, I'll put together a bunch of, of bullet points of, of things I wanna go over. And in practice, I don't usually check it much while I'm recording. I'll usually just do stream of consciousness, right? <laughs> me, me writing the bullet list helps me remember the points I want to make. And I don't know, half the time or more, I just speak off the top of my head and I pretty much cover everything. But I have it there in case I lose my train of thought. And also usually at the end, I'm like, okay, well, that, that was a nice wrap up that I did, but let me see if I missed anything, right? Because then I can always record the thing I missed and then insert that. Uh, and then editing, I have a Mac computer at home with iMovie. Uh, I suppose at some point when this gets professional, I'll get uh, the, what is a Final Cut Pro. Uh, but iMovie is, is pretty good for my purposes. I mean, this isn't any professional setup here. It's just me and my home. Usually the raw footage of video will go over 50 minutes. And the last couple have gone over an hour. Uh, I did get a question uh, which was during the premiere of my last video, Show Manager, which is like, how much editing do I do? And it really depends how long it is. So if it's uh, if it's like an hour long, I usually try to cut it down so it's about 40 minutes. Some of my earlier videos are shorter, like 20, 25 minutes, but the more recent ones usually end up around 40 minutes. Sometimes they're 35, sometimes they're 45, but 40-ish how much editing I need to get into that range really depends on how much I have to say, how much I blow past that kind of limit. Uh, I do edit out any ums and breaks that are two seconds or longer. I try not to do too much editing of shorter pauses. Although if it's a really long video, then I will go through and like really edit you know, I'll cut even like one second pauses, you know, in between sentences. And so that might result in a kind of a choppy video, but you can cut a lot of time out of a video by doing that. Uh, I, I just, I don't want people to go like, oh my God, a 15 minute video. I, I oh my, I'm not gonna watch this, right? I, I want people to feel like it's consumable. <laughs> and 40 minutes is still probably too long, but in terms of editing, I'll usually do two passes of edits at least, like I said, sometimes if it's a really long video, I sometimes do th three edits, but like one run of an edit is like, obviously cutting out the big breaks, the big pauses, and also just removing, you know, things like points I made that I, I said clumsily or I changed my mind about saying. And so the first pass is just removing all that stuff, right? And then the second pass, I'm going it over with kind of a more fine tooth comb and seeing if I can sometimes move things around so the flow makes a little bit more sense. 
sometimes I'll add just tiny little gags. I know they're not much. I'm not a comedian, but they're fun for me. I, you know, if I do like a, a goofy thing, that's just because I felt like it. I'm, I'm really entertaining myself more than anything. Uh, there's lots of things that I do that n probably aren't amusing to anyone else, but they amuse me. And in the end, isn't that what matters? Where did you develop your ease with public speaking slash camera speaking? Is there a component of public address in your job or did you major in theater in uni, perhaps? I mean, if you were to ask me what my personality traits were, being at ease in public speaking, I wouldn't have thought was one of them. I mean, when I was in university, no, I didn't do any public speaking or, or acting or anything like that. Um, certainly if we had to do like a group presentation, I was often the one to do the presentation. I'm, I'm what you call in some things a crippling perfectionist, right? I could never be a written reviewer because I would edit and edit and edit and it would take forever before I was satisfied with it and put it out. But talking live, like in person, you can't be perfect, right? You're, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to say ums and ahs a lot and you just kind of have to go with it. Like if you're, so it's actually for me, it's actually a little bit freeing. If I have time to perfect it, I will. But if I'm there just out and talking to people, there's there's no redos, there's no, you know, there's no loading previous save files, <laughs> right? If you make a mistake, you have to recover, right? Laugh it off, right? You know, do a self-deprecating joke or whatever, and just move on. Certainly the restaurant does help um, doing a lot of customer service, you know, you, you talk a lot. <laughs> um, so I guess that helps, but yeah, I mean, I'm glad that I come off that way. I wouldn't consider myself a particularly sociable person. Um, but yeah, this is, Hey, it's just you and me. As long as it's just the two of us, I don't feel nervous. You put 50 people out there, maybe I'll get a little nervous, but one-on-one. -on -one. I, I think I can handle that. Okay, I got this question twice. I mean, one of them is technically not a question, but would you be interested in doing top tens? And it would be awesome to see a top games list from you. Oh boy. So top tens are so common, right? And I mean, obviously they're common for a reason. They're popular. People like them and YouTubers want to do them to satisfy people. And so people will watch their YouTube videos and not someone else's. Maybe maybe this channel would be like twice as popular if I did regular top 10 lists. I don't know. I just know that I always have this desire to do things differently than other people, right? If, if I see that the popular thing to do is a and I see so many people doing A and they're doing it great. I feel like, man, I'm not going to get involved in that. I can't compete with all that. I'm just going to do my own thing. I'm going to do B over here, right? And nobody else is doing B. Maybe that that can just be something for me. So my initial thought is I don't want to do top ten lists because so many other people do them. But I suppose I should, shouldn't I? I mean, I should. My son keeps telling me I have to do it, right? Because people want them, right? I suppose I suppose on YouTube, people are searching top 10 or something and then, you know, a whole bunch of stuff comes out, right? I really hate the idea of top 10s comparing wildly different games. I hate that. Like, if you do, like, you know, top 10 worker placement games, I can be like, Okay, but I mean, there's lots of worker placement games out there. In some ways, you're going to be comparing a little bit apples to oranges. But, you know, sure, right? I can sort of get behind that. But then you, you have stuff like, I don't know, like top 10 games from 2020. And I, I look at that and I'm like, how can anybody possibly do that? There are so many different games out there. You got party games. You got kind of lighter family style games. You got, you know, the 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 light but deep kind of strategy games. And you have the super complex games, right? And you have war games. And you have... How can you possibly 
compare those and say what are the top 10 games you could say like i think this is the best war game to come out in 2020 and i think this is the best you know complex euro to come out in 2020 but of those two how do you say what's number one and what's number two it doesn't make any sense to me if i do it i have to do my own spin on it and i'm open to ideas so if you have suggestions feel free to to put them in the in the comments um, I could use some direction here. <laughs> I really could. And I listen. I listen to everybody who's, who speaks up. So feel free if you have some ideas. I'm thinking, this is just spitballing, but I'm thinking I don't want to do a top 10. But I could do like... It would have to be alliterative, though. So like top 10, but not. It would have to be like a some other number, like a like a notable number. A notable number of games. Maybe if there's a topic like worker placement, instead of doing top 10, just do like, oh, here's a notable number of older worker placement games that maybe you haven't heard of if you're newer to the hobby. Right? I'm not saying they're like these hidden gems, right? These hidden games, these unknown games. But certainly they're games that aren't really talked about much anymore. And I could just bring a highlight, like I often do, to games that just aren't talked about much anymore. So I could do like... <laughs> like a an elder eight a four bear four bearer five for four bearer four would probably be better but it has to be alliterative I, I i'm standing my ground on that all right Thanks for watching. Remember, older games don't stop being good just because newer games come out. Take care.